chairs. That's, watch out for flying chairs, as Leroy McGurk used to say. So, what, 10, 15 years ago, you're still in high school in Blackwell, Oklahoma. <laughs> Did you ever think, when you were in high school together, that one day, you would be on stage in front of a bunch of fans in Charlotte, North Carolina, celebrating the long and illustrious careers that both of you have had. Yes. That's my song. He said, yes, he did. <laughs> Now, both of you had a lot of success, both as... How about you? Yeah. 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 Is your mic working? No. 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 We should switch. Or my next number. Yeah. Now, both of you had a lot of success as singles wrestlers. Both of you had a lot of success as tag team wrestlers. What was the most fun part about teaming up together? Well, for me, it was, a, it was you know, just seemed a natural thing to do. Uh, uh, you know, as, as, as the younger and smaller brother, I always looked up to my brother, and, uh, and I had a tremendous amount of respect for his ability and everything. And, uh, you know, of course, the advice he gave me coming along and uh, how, to, how to prepare for this business and how to prepare for the world. To me, uh, it was better than winning the World Junior Heavyweight title uh, when I was able to team up with my brother and win the world title. That's probably the, the greatest moment of my career. Well, for me, it was uh, you know starting a few years ahead of uh, Jerry and wanting to accomplish a lot of individual uh, accomplishments as an individual, and, and he was wanting to do the same thing. So it was a, a combination of being able to accomplish those things as an individual and later on been able to set our sights and been able to work 100% as a tag team and, uh, and uh, set our sights on what we could accomplish as a tag team. Ready to take some questions from the fans? Yeah. Tell us your name and uh, where you're from what's your question. My name is Scott Burton. I'm from Advance, North Carolina. And my question to you two gentlemen, y'all probably by far growing up, you were my, when I was growing up, y'all were one of my favorite tag teams, I'd like to say. And second of all, at Starcade 83, I remember when y'all lost the titles to Steamboat and Youngblood. How did y'all get y'all's break after that in WWE? And did y'all ever wear the tag team titles in WWE? How did you end up in with the World Wrestling uh, Entertainment? And did you ever get the tag team titles? Uh, well, the, the second part of the question, no, we didn't. We chased uh, Dick Murdoch and uh, Adrian Adonis around for quite a while. We beat them in several non-title bouts uh, throughout the United States. They were a very formidable tag team and uh, uh, quite honestly we, we were having the opportunity to uh, to get to that and uh, it was time to uh, kind of back off and, and kind of step back and uh, we were uh, preparing to wrestle another young tag team at that time, uh, Wyndham and, uh, and uh, Rotunda and these bodies had just taken too many beatings from Steamboat and Youngblood and Wahoo and Valiant and all these Mid-Atlantic guys. He's told the truth though. When uh, we failed to get it from Murdoch and Adonis and uh, uh, Wyndham and Rotunda ended up with the belts and uh, there they were like 22 years old. Here we were uh, <clears throat> so many years old. <laughs> I said, I think it's time that I retired. So I went on home. It got cold. Is it, if you would, tell the story where you couldn't find the car, and that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. We were in Pittsburgh, or we were in uh, Newark, New Jersey. We'd just come in from Pittsburgh. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning. We'd been up in uh, Pennsylvania for just several days, and it was just sleeting and snowing, the wind blowing 40 miles an hour, and the lake coming off that, the wind coming off that Lake Erie. And so we got into uh, Newark, and was in the parking lot trying to find a car, and it was a, a blinding uh, snowstorm. Of course, every car there was covered with a foot of snow, and they all looked like alike. So 
we walked around for about an hour trying to find a car and never did find a car. And I kept hearing these airplanes take off to the south. And I knew one of them was going to Florida and I turned to him, I told him, the next one of those planes heading south, I'm gonna be on it. So we left Newark, New Jersey. Hey, um, what was your memories on working uh, angle with uh, Steamboat and Youngblood? Your memories about getting to wrestle Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood? Uh, these two young guys were tremendous athletes, and what a, what a great tag team combination. Uh, Ricky and Jay were just like clockwork. They were so smooth and everything about them, and uh, they just, their, their technique was just, just unbelievably good. And uh, Jack and I wanted to, to wrestle them, and we figured it was our opportunity, and uh, we wanted to go against them, and we had a, uh, honestly, a, a hard time convincing Jim Crockett, the promoter here, Jim Crockett Jr., that was the right thing to do. Jack and I had always been fan favorites, and uh, and so had Ricky and Jay, and uh, Jimmy just didn't think it would work, and uh, we uh, had a meeting with him and uh, convinced him it was the right thing to do, and, uh, and we were fortunate enough to do them, and uh, we felt like uh, we helped Ricky and Jay advance to the next level, and of course, uh, we were able to capture the uh, World Tag Team Champions from them on uh, couple occasions and uh, went on and defended them against several tag teams here but it was uh, it was truly a highlight I think next to uh, working with uh, Dory and Terry Funk that uh, wrestling Jay and Ricky were the highlights of my career anyway. I agree totally uh, they're two of the uh, greatest wrestlers of, of all time really and uh, Jerry and I had just a wonderful time wrestling with them because it, it was uh, so terrific and uh, it's one of the highlights of my life also. What's your name? Tell us where you're from and what's your question. Uh, my name is Russell Badger and I'm from Rivar. And my question is, I haven't read your book and I hope you address this in the book, but I have read Ollie Anderson's and his account of the sale of uh, Georgia and Florida wrestling to Vince McMahon isn't really flattering to you guys. Could you explain your side of what happened with that sale and why you did it? First of all, I'd like to point out the book is available. We can remedy that fact that you haven't read Jack Briscoe's book. Okay, you bought it this weekend? Okay. We can remedy that. Uh, Ole deals in fiction. <laughs> yeah, Ole was real upset about the sale, no doubt about it. And uh, uh, Jerry and I, we'd uh, been working towards this a long time. Uh, we knew the business was going uh, towards Vince's way, that uh, Vince would eventually take over, you know, the whole country, but he had all the top talent and all the small, smaller territories were really suffering at that time, as most of you know if you've been wrestling fans a long time. And uh, we knew, we saw the handwriting on the wall and we just figured it was time to do what was best for us while the time was right. Sir, what's your name? Tell us where you're from and what's your question? Uh, my name's Randall Brown. I live in Shiloh, North Carolina at this point in time. I've got a question that's kind of along the same lines as that last one, except uh, I guess when I was younger, I was a heel fan, so I'm going to ask a heel type question. Everybody wants to know who your favorite people were in the business. I'd like to know who were the people in the business that you didn't like and basically why. Who were the people that you didn't like and why? Ole Anderson. <laughs> Especially after you read the book. <laughs> so you know, you know, you deal with a, a lot of unique individuals in, in our business, and, and it's a great business, and that, and that's what makes it a great business because everybody is a different individual, different characters, and there were different characters to make you like them. Uh, Ole and Gene Anderson, who Gene Anderson is one of my all-time favorites. I'll go along that. I couldn't find anybody that. Uh, that uh, maybe Rip Hawk, and uh, you know, he was the eternal bad guy here in Charlotte, North Carolina, him and Sweet Hanson, who both of those guys I love dearly. They, they taught me a lot in the business, and Gene taught me a lot. Uh, uh, but you know, you deal with it, different individuals all the time. Uh, uh, both my brother and I were brought up to not hate a lot of things and not disrespect a lot of things. and. Uh, through thick and thin, you know, you stick by your your, your warriors that you that you compete with, and uh, we had disagreements with uh, uh, one of the Anderson brothers, and uh, you know, what's past is past, and uh, I don't think uh, we hate anybody, and I, you know, as far as dislike, there's probably more people that 
disliked me and my brother than, than that we dislike. Tell us who, where you're from, who you are, and what's your question? Uh, my name is Dick Bourne. I'm from Mount Airy, North Carolina. Um, I got two questions. Can I do that? All right, Jerry, first of all, um, early 70s, you were real big in the Mid-Atlantic area, holding the Eastern title for several years, and I guess I was, you mentioned Rip Hawk, and I wanted to know your thoughts about wrestling Rip Hawk and um, the Missouri Mauler and Ole for the title. You traded the title. Uh, those guys really sort of passing on. Well, you were young at the time. Talk a little bit about that. Let's do one question at a time. Jerry, your thoughts about wrestling here in the Carolinas, especially early in your career against Rip Hawk and some of the stars? Well, I was really blessed. I, my brother got me the opportunity to go to uh, Australia, the country of Australia, as, as a real young wrestler, just basically right out of, out of uh, Oklahoma State University. And during that tour over there, which I spent a year uh, competing in, uh, in Australia against some of the top uh, wrestlers in the world who just, you know, took me under their wing, basically, and, uh, and uh, taught me the ways of the business and taught me how to work in the ring and how to conduct myself outside of the ring and the, how to give interviews and just the various things, you know, the, the, the great veterans over there. And one of those veterans over there happened to be uh, Rip and Swede. And uh, Rip, thank God, saw something in me and called Mr. Crockett, Jim Crockett Sr., and uh, see if he could pave the way for me. And uh, Jim opened the door for me to come in. First time I came in, uh, if you remember, I was here for maybe a few short months because uh, uh, Johnny Becker and, uh, and uh, that crew was still in charge. and. <laughs> I had long hair down to my shoulder and wore bell bottom pants, and I was kind of the young, you know, at that time, I guess you could say hippie in the, uh, in the area, and uh, I was told to cut my hair, and I looked over at Jim Crockett, and, and I can say that now because uh, of my thinning hair, that I believe there's too many uh, people with thinning hair in this territory now, more than my hair as it is. And needless to say, with uh, George Becker, the booker, uh, I was gone real quick, and, uh, and went back to Australia, then about six weeks later, uh, Jim Crockett called Eddie Graham, who where Jack had been uh, wrestling and very successfully, and they called me and told me the opportunity would be there for me if I came back to uh, Carolina, so I came back. So, But getting in the ring against uh, Rip Hawk was, was truly a thrill, and I remember my first TV appearance here was in High Point, North Carolina, and I wrestled Rip and Sweet, and I guess my partner got bumped out of the ring, got hurt, and, and I took care of Rip and Sweet basically uh, by myself. And, uh, from there, we were off and running. So Rip uh, is kind of my mentor in this business and, and a guy that I tremendously look up to and a guy that gave me advice all the way through my career. Missouri Mahler, oh man, I'll say the story for Jack here, but there was nobody like him. He's a, he, everybody sees that cartoon out there, the Tasmanian Devil. Missouri Mahler was the Tasmanian Devil, brother. <laughs> this guy would take you from pillar to post and collar and elbow and every way, and you never know which direction he was coming from. And what a great, great thrill it was. I mean, it was kind of intimidating uh, going in against a veteran like that. Rip was a great technical wrestler, so I knew I could keep up with Rip, you know, because I knew I could wrestle. So. Working with Rip was like a great wrestling match, and I enjoyed it so much, you know, going in and out of the hose and then the counters and all the moves like that. But Missouri Mahler, man, oh man, you better watch everything because that guy was coming at you full speed. But it was truly a pleasure, and I had the opportunity of wrestling Mahler just about all over the all over the country, and it was I had a great time doing it because you never knew which Missouri Mahler you were going to get. You know, he come out different every time, and uh, he took the attack to you. And your other other uh, And your other person? question? No, the other person, you named three. Uh, well, and of course, he traded the title with Ole as well. Ole. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'll give Ole the credit. Inside the ring, uh, Ole Anderson was one of the top, top guys that I ever competed against. I mean, Ole was a guy who could bring it to you on the mat and wrestle the hell out of you and beat you up at the same time. And uh, he certainly tried it several times, and he kept kept the pressure on, but you know, as, as a young competitor and as a young good guy, that's what you want. You want somebody that beats the crap out of you and makes it look real because it was real with Ole in the ring uh, beating up on you all the time. I enjoyed wrestling Ole. We have differences, but that's outside the ring. Inside the ring, uh, had nothing but respect for him inside the ring. And your second question? Thanks, Jerry. Jack, um, a lot of us, of course, being primarily Mid-Atlantic wrestling fans here, and when you, you know, the Mid-Atlantic 
title had been the top title in the area in the seventy's in the early eighty's it sort of became sort of a mid tier title but when you and roddy piper battled for the title and then you and dory funk traded the title and we had two former n w a champions trading our our regional title all of a sudden the mid-atlantic title was back up top and i just wondered if you'd share a little bit about memories about piper and, and wrestling dory funk for the mid-atlantic title your well, mid-atlantic title feud against dory funk and roddy piper yeah that was a great memory uh roddy piper uh i've become uh, fans of roddy piper of course living in florida and watching the uh, wrestling show out of Atlanta. And uh, I had never met Piper. And, and uh, Piper was such a ball of energy and had so much talent and was uh, just ready to go 100% at all times. And so I, when I first came here and got the opportunity to wrestle Roddy, I was very excited about it. And I really enjoyed it. And uh, Roddy's a lot like that Tasmanian devil too. And uh, Roddy brought a lot of prestige to that title. He did a lot for that title. So. I don't take any of that credit in raising the, the standards of that title. I give that all to Roddy Piper. But Dory Funk Jr. happened to be here at the same time, so all three of us were wanting that title, and, and it just made a, a real good competition and uh, uh, made it real fun to go after, and, and uh, we made the title mean a whole lot. But I give the majority credit to Roddy Piper. And what was it like wrestling Dory Funk for the Mid-Atlantic title? Well, uh, Junior, uh, anytime you get in the ring with Junior, you know you're going to have to work as hard as you, you ever had to work for whatever time it was because Junior never let up. Junior never tired. You couldn't tire Junior out, and uh, it was great. I uh, had a lot of success with uh, Junior because I knew when I got in the ring with Junior, it was going to be 100% and uh, hard work all the way, and I, and I loved it. I really enjoyed it. What's your name, and tell us uh, what your question is. Uh, yes, I'm Mike Hanneman from Norfolk, Virginia, and I had a question for uh, Jack and one for Derry. Uh, first, Jack, um, you're one of the few people to actually retire and stay retired. Were you ever tempted to come back? Any temptations to ever uh, come back, get back on that plane? Well, <laughs> yes. When uh, uh, WWF started making all that big money, and uh, <laughs> I thought about it for quite a while, but uh, never really seriously. I, I had a great career, and. Uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. I, I got to, uh, to make it to the top with the, as an individual and also got to make it to the top with my brother Jerry. And I was very uh, happy with our career and uh, I was very satisfied with it. And uh, I thought about it a couple times, but never really seriously. And uh, Jerry, um, with so many neck injuries and early retirements nowadays in wrestling, would you prefer to see WWE continue to head more towards like Shawn Michaels, Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat style wrestling and away from like the crash and burn ECW style wrestling? Uh, you're right, uh, there has been an uh, unfortunate rash of injuries uh, within our industry and uh, you know these guys are they're tremendous athletes and they're going out trying to please each and every fan that sits in the audience and uh, uh, it got to the point where you know a, a simple drop kick probably wasn't enough and you know we were all victims of circumstances and we all try to push that envelope just a little bit farther and a little bit farther but I think uh, it was pushed by ECW just a tad too far and uh, there were a lot of injuries and, and people come to expect that style and uh, with, with the athletes like Kurt Angle now and uh, Chris Benoit and uh, now with Randy Orton who's a third generation uh, these guys are back uh, doing wrestling hoes and I, and, I, and I hope eventually that the, the fans will start really appreciating the effort and the uh, and the intensity that these young men have. Uh, I mean, you watch a Chris Benoit match and it, it takes you back to old school. It really does. It's yeah. awesome. yeah. it's, it's like watching a, a Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk Jr. match, and I have so much respect for the Kurt Angles and the Chris Benoits of the world, and, and I, uh, I don't think we have enough of them, and I wish there was more of them out there. Uh, I'm Michael Hamilton. What was it like wrestling Harley Race for the NWA title? Uh, Harley Race is uh, literally one of the toughest individuals that ever walked the planet. Uh, Harley is just, uh, I never seen anybody so dedicated to the wrestling business as Harley Race. And uh, he gave his whole life and he gave it 100%. And uh, he's one hell of a man. And uh, it was really a pleasure wrestling Harley because uh, just like Junior, Anytime, anywhere you want to go, as long as you want to go, Harley was ready. It didn't matter when, where, or how. But I have nothing but the greatest amount of respect for Harley.
Michelle, while we're waiting for our next question, you mentioned a moment ago Kurt Angle, Chris Benoit, and Randy Orton. How close is Shelton Benjamin to getting to that level? Oh, boy, I'm, I'm so proud of Shelton. I uh, don't know if a lot of you guys know, but I brought uh, Shelton Benjamin into the, uh, the WWE a few years back. Uh, one of his, his college coach, uh, Jay Robinson, up at the University of Minnesota, was a teammate of Jack and I's at Oklahoma State University. And uh, I'd called about uh, Brock Lesnar, and uh, Jay told me there's a young kid from uh, Orangeburg, South Carolina, that'll just blow you away. His personality is just out there. His athletic ability is second to none. <coughs> Him and Brock push each other around all day long, and you never know who's going to win. And the intensity of the, in their matches in the wrestling room at the University of Minnesota was legendary. So I flew up basically to meet uh, Brock. And during that visit, I was able to, to visit with Sheldon Benjamin. And, uh, holy cow, what a tremendous athlete. Just looking at this young man, he just oozes with charisma, just the ability. And I think uh, within a year or so, uh, Sheldon's gonna, gonna be a major, major superstar for the WWE. And just Taboo Tuesday here, you fans uh, kind of proved what I was saying uh, through the fan vote. Uh, Sheldon got more votes than seven other guys combined. And that kind of, spoke volumes for this young man's ability and what you guys think of him and uh, kind of just uh, 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 solidified what our thoughts about him was. And he's not too far away. If this young man continues and stays healthy and stays injury free, the sky's the limit for Sheldon Benjamin. Yeah, my name is Michael Hicks from Irwin, North Carolina. Uh, Jerry, this is a question for you. Um, pertaining to the NWA World Junior Heavyweight Championship and your matches with Les Thornton. Uh, it seemed like the title you know, really kind of went downhill after that. Les gave the title a lot of credibility, a lot of respect, um, you know, and the people that held it before him, Danny Hodge and all those. Um, you know, wanted to get your comments on that, the, uh, you know, your matches with Les, the, and, and the, you know, the importance that y'all built up to the Junior Heavyweight title because, you know, after the early 80s, nobody really, you know, cared much for that championship. Uh, thank you. It's a great question. Uh, you spoke of uh, one man who I idolized growing up, Danny Hodge, who held the title for so long. You can go back in history with uh, Vern Gagne, the, the great wrestler from, uh, from Minnesota also, and uh, Danny and uh, Les. And uh, Les and I had some, some great battles, and I enjoyed wrestling with Wes, uh, Les because uh, he was similar to me, only he had that European flair about him and uh, European style, and he was a master of, of all kinds of, uh, of holds. And, and it was unfortunate after, uh, after I did get uh, defeated by Les Thornton that the, the title uh, kind of went downhill and uh, it kind of got lost in the shuffle there. But uh, the, the athletes that competed for that title were tremendous athletes and, and, and uh, worked their hardest to, to, to make it. On a, on a larger level, and I, I really regret sometime that, uh, that I wasn't able to hang on to it a little bit longer. I just uh, uh, I felt like I could do it some good, and, and uh, Les, uh, when, when Les took it from me, then I forgot who he dropped it to after that, but it kind of dropped off the face of the earth. But uh, it was a great division at that time, and it could be a great division now, and I believe with our WWE Cruiserweights that we have now, uh, Chavo Guerrero and some of these young men like that, uh, that uh, it's going to, going to uh, gain recognition because they continually have tremendous matches each time we put a title match up, guys like Rey Mysterio and some of these uh, cruiserweights that we have now for the WWE. And like to point out, if you want to see an example of great junior heavyweight wrestling and Jerry Briscoe, what a great junior heavyweight Jerry Briscoe was, Southern Superstars of the 70s has a match from St. Petersburg, Jerry Briscoe challenging Danny Hodge for the World Junior Heavyweight Championship. James from Charlotte. Jack, this question's for you. I would like to know if there's any one person who stands out around the time you were the world champion, or maybe just after, anybody who didn't get a run as the world champion that you felt perhaps should have deserved a run? Yes, there is a, a Dick Murdoch from uh, Texas. Dick was a great wrestler. Uh, Dick was a great character. He was really a, a wild and crazy guy. And uh, he was as tough as they come to. And he, he loved a street brawl, and, or he would 
get down on the mat and wrestle with you. But I thought Dickie had all the talent in the world. He drew money everywhere he went all over the world. And uh, uh, Dick was, he was a fantastic athlete. And uh, never, Dick never did get his shot at it. And I always thought that Dick, he, he would be what if he had been a great world champion. Hi, Jason from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I know a lot of questions later on. We'll probably get to road stories. I'd like to hear um, your most memorable moments from competing at Oklahoma State. Most memorable moments competing at Oklahoma State. Well, this guy over here from Ohio just brought back one. It wasn't a very fond memory. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time uh, that I had ever been uh, defeated in college was the, for the uh, national championship in 1964. I come up against a fellow by the name of Harry Huska, who defeated me for the uh, national championship. And uh, that was one of my most disappointing moments. Uh, uh, my team won the national championship that year, but I finished second. But the, the gentleman from Ohio would remind me of that. <laughs> Jack, which is a stronger memory for you, winning the national title the next year or your only collegiate loss the year before the NCAA finals? Well, I don't even remember the match where I won, but I remember every point and every move where I lost. <laughs> Just a sidebar on that, I recently uh, discovered a, a tape that uh, nobody had uh, seen and my brother hadn't seen for over 35 years and I was able to purchase it. And it was uh, Jack's victory in the NCAA championships against his opponent and I, I, I presented that to him as a gift and, uh, he had a lot of hair back then. <laughs> well, I'm glad he didn't find the one where I got beat. That's your next birthday. <laughs> yeah, it's a Mike uh, from Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I want to uh, ask Jerry, how did you get involved with the Vince McMahon Stone Cold uh, boss employee feud? I've always liked that angle, and I want to know how you got involved with it. The Stooges, right? <laughs> <laughs> I told Pat Patterson, and Pat's probably one of the most tremendous uh, technical wrestlers of all time, and uh, anybody that's ever seen one of his matches knows what I'm talking about. Pat's, uh, Pat Patterson and Ray Stevens are uh, one of those good wrestlers. I, I told Pat, I said, Pat, you and I both worked for 30 years trying to maintain a reputation and, and build, build a respect as, as wrestlers. And, and, Five minutes with Vince McMahon and Stone Cold all, uh, Steve Austin, we turned into the Stooges. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> it was it was a great deal, and it, had, it just happened to come. And some of the greatest things in in, in our business just happened to evolve. And um, they called Pat and Vince and I in a in a uh, locker room. Our cameras were running backstage and everything. They called Pat and uh, Vince and I in a conversation backstage uh, in Chicago, talking. Uh, talking about Stone Cold, and it was just, you know, we were just coming up with just insane things to do, you know, and, uh, and uh, we uh, this thing could, has legs, you know, why don't we take it out in front of the audience? So we went out there, and Pat and I became the uh, the corporate stooges for Vince, and uh, every time Stone Cold would come in uh, Vince's way, Vince would push one of us in the way, and we'd get the short end of the stick, you know, you know and so. But it was tremendous. It was one of the funnest parts of my career that I ever had. It was just a, a revival, and uh, I was so thankful for the opportunity to be in the ring. I mean, uh, a guy my age in the ring uh, competing on that kind of a level against a Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, The Undertaker, and you know the the, the various guys that uh, we had to had to take up for Vince and get short in the stick with. Uh, Pat and I, I think, took every finishing hold there was in the business, you know, <laughs> including a Dudley table, you know, and it, uh, it was it was a great great uh, amount of fun, and uh, it, it was it was fun while it lasted. But the bumps and bruises that I that I took and Pat took, uh, it was it was it was kind of hard on our bodies, and I, I'm kind of glad it's over with. But it was a fun thing. I think we took it to a different generation, and uh, and some of the young kids got to see how Pat Patterson could still get over with each and every one of you guys out there because of, uh, the Stooge character was, was, a, was a strong character for the WWE. And I, I think just the, the, the professionalism and, and the charisma of Pat Patterson and, and, uh, and uh, me being the sidekick there just, uh, just helped a lot of young guys. Hey, you know, if you, if you work hard, you just give the audience what they want, you know, and, and you, you can make it. I was very thankful for the opportunity. It was just one of those
those things will be bothered. Yeah, and everybody asked me, he said, what do you think of your brother wearing a dress? Boy, he made one ugly woman, didn't he? <laughs> my youngest son uh, said, Dad, you look like China's mother. <laughs> Fifteen years of tag team wrestling pretty much being wiped out of the scene. What happened to tag team wrestling? Well, uh, you know, tag team wrestling is, is alive and well, but it's not a division like it was a division when we had people. You know, you, you like you like the superstars. You know, you like the Undertakers. You like the Stone Cold. You like the Rocks. And uh, you know, now when you have a tag team, it's kind of a combination of those guys in. And, So it's a shame. It's a great division. Of course, Jack and I love the division. Uh, we were masters of it for several years, and uh, and I, you know, it's like the like the the, the cruiserweights and the junior heavyweights. It's just something that uh, our business has evolved. And uh, uh, but you know, if if you watch, I think uh, with the WWE are making an effort to to kind of bring it back into into vogue. We have we have some outstanding young tag teams uh, on the horizon, and uh, hopefully we can rebuild that. My name is Tony Crawford. I'm from Pageland, South Carolina. And uh, I was wondering, um, whatever happened to the six man? I know six man tag team used to be popular also. Uh, they haven't gone back yet. I was wondering, when would that come back? Every Monday night in the main event on Raw. <laughs> uh, six mans are, it's, uh, it's a great combination. And, and uh, like Mark says, you see it, we do uh, probably more six mans than we actually do uh, tag teams, uh, but you know, back in the old days, there was uh, Funk Senior, Funk Junior, and Terry Funk, and then Jack and I would team up with uh, another guy, so, you know, it was, it was predominant, but six-man wrestling is, is very exciting, uh, especially, you know, back in the old days, you'd have uh, the spoiler, some of these guys, and you throw in uh, old Playboy Gary Hart or Sir Oliver Humperdinck or some of those great managers of the of the past, and uh, I was told this afternoon that uh, Sir Oliver Humperdinck was the greatest manager because he was the greatest six-man wrestler of all time. So, you know, hopefully uh, we can get back to that. I vote go for Gary Hart. <laughs> At one point, didn't you have some matches, you, Jack, and Eddie Graham against all three funks? Yes, we did. Uh, we were looking at a magazine one of the fans brought through the line today that we was autographing, and uh, we both actually kind of it, it disappeared from our thoughts, and we saw the picture there, and it brought it all back, and uh, it was a, a great time because uh, the old man Funk was quite a character. Uh, he was uh, wild and crazy. He's just like his son Terry. Terry and him were a lot alike, and uh, Junior tried to keep him under control, but he didn't have a chance, but uh, it was a lot of fun because uh, Junior was such a great wrestler, and then, of course, the old man, well, he was king of the Texas Brass uh, Knuckles match, and then Terry, he would he would go either way. He'd fight or wrestle. It didn't make him any difference. Uh, since everybody sees, seems to be talking about tag team wrestling, is there a tag team that you see today that reminds uh, you guys of yourselves? When uh, we had Sheldon Benjamin and, and uh, Charlie Haas together, uh, God, what a great well tag team they were, two great amateur wrestlers. They, they really, and, and, and flatteringly, uh, they, they got tapes of Jack and I and uh, Ricky and Jay and studied those tapes. And I, I think uh, Charlie and Sheldon were, were a tremendous tag team. And uh, they, I think they came the closest of duplicating uh, any tag team that we have, uh, you know, that we had in the past. They were great athletes, great collegiate wrestlers. And they they took pride in bringing the wrestling part of it to the mat. I'm Scott again from Advance, and Jerry, this question's for you. The night at Unforgiven in Greensboro with Stone Cold and Dude Love, uh, I would like for you, if you wouldn't mind, sharing maybe a memorable moment with you and Pat and Vince with that angle. And second of all, has Vince McMahon maybe ever considered having maybe a world six-man tag team? As far as the World 16, uh, 16 uh, Tag Team Championship, uh, no. Uh, uh, at 
one time uh, Michael Hayes, P.S. Michael Hayes, Freebird Forever. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah he tried to convince uh, uh, Mr. McMahon that that was. Uh, <laughs> I do your way, though. <laughs> He was trying to convince Vince that, that was uh, the, the way to go, but uh, uh, he never bought it. And uh, you brought back a smile on my face with uh, Dude Love and, uh, and all that. And, uh, and it, it was it was so much fun back uh, back in those days. Like uh, like I said before, uh, you know, with Mick Foley, uh, I had some great little what we call the vignettes with him, where we you know we were pouring back and forth, and uh, we just seemed to have that. that proper chemistry. So anything I did with Mick Foley uh, was tremendous. We got in an argument one time, it was the old, uh, uh, you know, no you didn't, yes I did, no you didn't, you know, he, he <laughs> took pride in stumping me every time, <laughs> you know, so that's some of the, some of the thoughts and some of the things that happened back then. Hi, Will from St. Louis. Uh, uh, Jerry, I got a chance to see you back in the studies and also Jack, and as a matter of fact, I saw Jack one of the first matches I saw was Jack and Dory, so hooked me on wrestling and uh, still been doing. Uh, one of the things that was impressed me about uh, the book uh, Jack did with William Murdoch is uh, how Pat O'Connor helped you get through the uh, championship years. And uh, he's, I, I consider Pat O'Connor like an unrecognized uh, person and kind of stuff. Everybody knows Harley. And maybe if you might just know about Pat O'Connor. Yes, I, um, uh, thank you, because I think that I've always had a great deal of respect for Pat O'Connor, and uh, Pat was very instrumental in my in my uh, rise to the throne and helped me win the uh, championship. Pat trained me a lot, and he even took time off from his own business in Kansas City to fly to Tampa, Florida, and spend hours working out with me on different moves and uh, maneuvers that uh, he had known over the years uh, through the spinning toe from uh, Gory Funk Jr. or Senior and the other guys that had used it. So he spent hours t uh, training me on that uh, technique of uh, reversing the bigger four leg lock. And uh, uh, I give him a lot of credit for helping me uh, uh, on to, to the title. And uh, yes, he was from uh, New Zealand and uh, drew some of the biggest uh, crowds in history up through Chicago and Toronto and uh, with Buddy Rogers who he won the title from. And Pat O'Connor, you're right, was one of the greatest champions of all time. Uh, my question uh, has a little lead into it. Uh, about two months ago, I had the distinct honor and pleasure of seeing a wrestling show promoted by Harley Race in Missouri. And I watched five matches without one single punch being thrown. I was just absolutely, totally impressed by that. And uh, it was certainly a, a tribute to Harley because I'm sure he was the one that uh, saw to it that that took place. My question is, do you think there's any possibility that a, the wrestling business itself will ever gravitate more in that direction away from the, uh, the high spots type matches that we see today? Do you think there's any possibility that it will ever go back to that or close to it? I think eventually it will get back to it somewhat. You'll always need, of course, your extra entertainment. But I, also I saw some of Harley's boys wrestle out in Las Vegas back in April. And I was very impressed with them. They, all the guys had, had knew all the moves. They knew when to do them at the proper time, and uh, knew how to execute them. And uh, they didn't punch. They didn't kick. And uh, they had some great matches. And the crowds really got into it. And uh, it was really good to see. Harley's done a great job with that school. Uh, that, that, I'd, I'd like to just like to throw a little bit further in there. Uh, independent groups are the backbone of this business. And uh, if you people out there have the opportunity to see an independent show, definitely go because they're, they're be the stars of the future. And these guys are, are working their butts off for not near the pay that uh, some of these WWE superstars are making. And uh, it's through you guys that we hear about these guys on the independent circle uh, circuit. And uh, it's very important that these circuits are out there. And guys like Carly Race, who teach these young men the basics and the fundamentals of our sport. You can't beat it. Uh, there's nothing better than uh, a, a good solid wrestler that can come out and doesn't have to rely on punches and kicks. So uh, the respect that, that I know my brother and myself have for, for uh, a great champion like Carly Race is, is well-deserved. And uh, 
He's doing a tremendous job, and I wish more and more of these independent circles, instead of going the ECW route, or would go the Harley route, because that's really how these guys are going to get advanced. Uh, we don't want guys going through tables. We don't want guys uh, jumping off 15-foot ladders and stuff like that. We want guys who know the basics, and through people like Harley Race, the business is going to live. Sort of an epilogue to that story, there was about 400 plus people there that night, which is absolutely amazing to me. I've been around the wrestling business most of my life, and uh, one of the things that really impressed me too was after the show was over, uh, the main event, they were part of the ring crew. <laughs> it was really a throwback. It was really, really special. Yeah, you sure you're not Mad Dog Bashan? <laughs> you got the boot on there. Yeah. Uh, you guys don't realize it. You guys are the voice of this business, and what you guys want is what you get and have a stronger voice you know get in numbers and speak up because this is the way you change the business because believe it or not we all listen to what the fans want and we try to give the fans what they want so you guys do have a voice it's uh it's tremendous and uh you know i, I think the innovation that vince came up with taboo tuesday proved that point we had a lot of matches that we didn't expect to have because people like you out there on the internet voting for what you wanted to see. So you do have a voice, and uh, speak up, guys. Question for both of you, but mainly for Jerry. When you guys did your heel run here in 83 with Steamboat Youngblood, your promos, you guys seem to be having so much fun on those promos, because when you guys turned, I quite frankly didn't think the Briscoes were going to be great heels, but you guys, especially Jerry, because you did most of the talking, for that, for that duo that you guys, you guys seem to be having so much fun on those promos. Just wanted some memories from that time. Well, my mother always said I was a good looking one. She always said Jerry's the one that wouldn't shut up. <laughs> I knew that line was coming. <laughs> we did, we had a ball. I mean, it was, you're able to open up, you know, you can say whatever you want to say. And at, at the time that, you know, the business was changing at that time too. And it was just, uh, it was kind of, you know, Jack, let's go for it, you know, let's don't hold back, you know, and, and it was so much fun, and some of the goofy things we did, and quite honestly, some of it was inspired by the Boogie Woogie Man who was out here today, who was, uh, you know, uh, following uh, the Boogie Woogie Man and, and, uh, and the Hot Rod, I mean, you had to pick it up, that's what the competition was here in the Mid-Atlantic, and uh, you just don't realize the, the competition that was here in the Mid-Atlantic Time. You look back and it's like a who's who of professional wrestling. You know, Sergeant Slaughter, Don Canoodle, uh, Ricky Steamboat, Ric Flair, Wahoo McDaniels, Johnny Valentine. Uh, I mean, you just go on and on and on. Paul Jones. Paul Jones. <laughs> <laughs> and so you had to pick it up. If you didn't pick it up, baby, you were left in, left in the dust of these guys because everybody was just shooting to the top at that time. And, uh, it gave me an opportunity to be my aggravating self, a little Sonny Fargo <laughs> used to say. <laughs> uh, he said, uh, you, he'd tell Jack, you're the most, ag your brother's the most aggravating guy I've ever seen in my life, you know. But, uh, you know, they gave me a chance to be myself, you know. <laughs> and I enjoyed the heck out of it. Yeah, hi, Carl from uh, Raleigh, and uh, I have two questions. First, for both of you, uh, the only time I've ever been in fear of the Briscoe Brothers' lives was when I heard that they were going to be taking on the Road Warriors at the Omni, and I just want to know your thoughts on working with a very young and very green Road Warrior. You think you were scared? <laughs> yeah, we were scared for our lives, too. We'd never actually see them in person until we showed up in the Omni that night and looked across the ring and saw those two monsters there, and we tried to change our mind, but... The referee wouldn't let us, but it was one of the baddest whippings I ever took in my life that night. The next day, one day, they strapped me over the shoulder in a turnbuckle and started throwing those tackles into me, and it went 300 pounds a piece running into the next day. I was black and blue all under my arm, all down my side there, but uh, we finally wore them down. We told them we was going to get them out in the ring and just, uh, get them on the floor where they wasn't any bigger than we are. We was going to wear them out, and that's what we did. We had the unenviable task of uh, working with the Road Warriors five times in two days. And, <laughs> yeah. and that, as you said, they were very green at the time. And uh, But you know what? 
wrestling overcomes that, you know. <laughs> and uh, and I, I really enjoyed that. I mean, it was a fight. It wasn't a wrestling match, and it, we don't even pretend it was a wrestling match. We knew what we were getting into uh, after that first go-round with them. And, uh, and I, I read in one of those uh, in, uh, uh, quotes on, on the Internet that they enjoyed working with Jack and I as much as we enjoyed working with them. They were great two individuals. And God bless uh, uh, Joe, or uh, Mike, that passed away here last year. And I uh, see Joe, uh, 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 animal up in Minneapolis, he's doing well. He's uh, converted his life, and he's a tremendous person now, and, uh, and they're great people. My well, like second question for both of you guys. What is, is as a traveling world champion, uh, what was your thoughts on Ric Flair when he first uh, got the NWA title? Well, I thought it was great. I, I've always been a big Ric Flair fan, and uh, I always knew that Ric would be world champion one day because Ric, he goes, he's the nature boy, and everybody could see that Ric was uh, bound for greatness, and he's turned out to be one of the greatest workers of all time. And uh, what you see on TV isn't put on with Ric. What you see <laughs> is Ric Flair. <laughs> he is the nature boy. He walks the walk and talks the talk 24-7. <laughs> Jerry, did you get to travel much as World Junior Heavyweight Champion? Uh, not as much as uh, my brother did. Uh, you know, I did get to, uh, to travel around quite a bit with it, but uh, not, not to the extent that uh, Jack was doing. I remember one night uh, we were in Richmond, Virginia. Jack uh, left, had, to, had a match. I think he went uh, an hour with uh, Thunderbolt Patterson that night, got on a plane. Uh, Jackie Crockett and myself rushed him out to the airport with uh, Six pack of beer under his arm to to rehydrate him was the only reason. You know? <laughs> when you take those long trips, you got to be hydrated. So I wanted to make sure my brother was safe, you know. <laughs> so uh, we rushed him over there. He had a match uh, in Tokyo, Japan, with the giant Bubba, and then uh, finished that match. Jumped back on a plane, and I met him in St. Louis, Missouri, with another six pack to make sure he was still uh, hydrated uh, in St. Louis. So uh, no, I never had that kind of schedule. Uh, traveling those days was different than it is today because uh, uh, we didn't have an agent or we didn't have an uh, investment man to set up all of our travel arrangements for us. We had to do it all over our own back in those days. And you usually uh, get in the habit of staying either the Holiday Inn or Ramada Inn and all the rooms looked alike and you just you jump on, spend the day on a plane, you run to the hotel, take a little nap and you run to the arena, you go back to the arena or from the arena back to the room and back to the airport. So after a while, you get to where you have to wake up in the morning, pull out your airplane ticket, and read it, see where you're at and where you're supposed to go. Did you always go straight from the arena back to the hotel room? Not always. <laughs> I have to get hydrated. His wife's in the back. Yes, he did. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Richie Blazo from Gibsonville, North Carolina. Um, past and present, what are you guys' favorite wrestling angles? Well, I think mine will always be with the Funks because we had such a, a tremendous long run with the Funks. And uh, we had a great time with uh, Terry and Junior and, and the old man while he was still alive. And uh, we got to shoot so many different angles with them in different parts of the country and all over the world, different parts of the world. So we had years and years of running with the Funks. And outside the Funks, it had to be with uh, Jun uh, Jay Youngblood and uh, Ricky Steamboat. I'll echo that uh, we had such a tremendous uh, run with the Funks and for years and years and years and years. It, it just, you know, we, we were able to compete with them you know, on just about every continent on the world and uh, it was known and uh, they came along at the right time and we come along at the right time where, you know, we were legitimate brothers, they were legitimate brothers and most of all the rivalry between uh, the great state of Oklahoma and that other state of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> So it was a lot of fun. Uh, currently, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like some of these uh, <laughs> five years in a row, too. <laughs> but uh, some of these, you know, the, the Kurt Angle, uh, the, the matches that Kurt has, and, uh, you know, the, the, the championship run of uh, Chris, and, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of good ones here currently. But my favorite, you know, the ones that you're involved in, and uh, those two that, uh, that Jack mentioned, uh, I certainly echo those. Scooter Leslie, uh, former ring announcer at the Greenville Memorial Auditorium. Um, Jack, 
you answered this question for me one time uh, over the telephone, but I think it would be very good that you answer this question for this audience. Uh, we see you pictured with a red NWA World Heavyweight Championship belt that has a lot of red felt on it. Later on, we see several pictures of you with a, uh, the uh, front face of the belt mounted on a black leather strap instead. Uh, there were some problems with that red belt. Could you please tell the story? Yeah, Scooter, thanks. Yeah, when uh, the brand new belt was first made is when I won the belt in uh, Houston, Texas from Harley Race. And, um, that was presented to me that night and it was made in Mexico. And the promoters thought it was a good idea to have the belt made up in a red, uh, red velvet and it had a suit, uh, a little carrying case to carry it and it looked like a, like a shotgun if it wasn't anything else. And uh, after having a belt for about three or four weeks and the guys fighting over it and me wearing it out of the ring, sweating with it and hitting other people over the head with it, and velvet got just filthy and sweaty and, and, and it just looked terrible just in a matter of a few weeks. So we had it converted from, uh, from red velvet over to black leather so we'd get some use out of it. That's after he fried the diamonds out of it. <laughs> that belt was solid, uh, with 10 pounds of solid gold in it. And Sam Mushnick was my boss and president of the NWA. So when I had it switched over to uh, the black leather, I told Sam that I actually melted the gold down and put fake gold in it, and he believed me for a while. Speaking of the world title belt, not too many people know this, but Jack, you also wore the Pat O'Connor, uh, Buddy Rogers, Luthez belt for a couple of weeks while they were making the conversion, didn't you? And junior belt. Yeah, well, I was making the conversion. I had title defenses around the country, so I, I, uh, they had retired uh, uh, Junior's old belt, Luthez's belt, and it, Sam Mushnick had it, of course. So I, I got the honor to wear that for a few weeks while mine was being converted. All right, um, I got a, one thing here to say and a question after that, but uh, I think everybody needs to get up and salute Gerald Briscoe for saluting the indie pro wrestling scene because uh, he made a very moving speech here just a few minutes ago. So I like for everybody. He, he got a nice ovation. I think he needs to get a better one than that. Yeah, I think you're right. Those indie boys work really hard, and uh, they they do a lot after their jobs and take a time off their job to to practice and work out and uh, spend their own money to travel these different towns. Those, those boys really worked hard and they deserved all they can get. Hey, thank you very much. My question to you is, um, what was your thoughts on when you were getting the NWA world title that night? What was your initial thoughts? Your thoughts uh, that day leading up to the ring? I was scared to death. It was something I'd always dreamed of, something I'd worked years for, and something I was finally gonna get to attain. And I was just scared to death that, uh, that uh, it just, uh, I wouldn't be able to maintain the prestige of the belt. And I was just really excited about it. And uh, it was one of the most thrilling days of my life, and probably the most nerve wracking days of my life. You got to realize, too, that Jack and uh, myself, Jack, uh, we were from Blackwell, Oklahoma, a small town of maybe 4,000 people at that time. And, uh, you know, you, you hadn't seen much but the wheat fields of Oklahoma and Kansas. And, uh, you know, for Jack to obtain something like that was very special to him and uh, the entire family. I'd also like to say we became professional wrestlers because, first of all, we became professional wrestling fans. We both were big fans. Uh, we'd had the TV over there in our hometown that was made by Leroy McGurk in, in Oklahoma City. We'd watch it every Saturday night. Danny Hodge was our hero. And uh, we became fans through going to the corner drugstore every Saturday morning and, and getting the wrestling magazines out and looking through the magazines till the store owner chased us out of there. <laughs> so we were wrestling fans long before we were wrestlers. Uh, yes, Mike again. Uh, this question's for uh, Jerry. When uh, something happens like uh, Bart Gunn getting knocked out by Butterbean or Daniel Pewter kind of holding his own against Kurt Angle, do you think that's bad for business to put the boys into uncontrollable situations like that, or do you think it's good that an overnight star can be made? 
Well, it, it's, it's, it's two-faced. I mean, it, sure, it, it's, it's a little damaging, but on the other hand, you're making a new star. So uh, it, it's, it has its pluses and minuses. Uh, of course, uh, with Butterbean and, uh, and uh, Bart Gunn, I mean, what a shocker that was. I mean, everybody's money actually was on uh, Dr. Death, uh, Steve Williams. And by the way, I'd like everybody to say a prayer tonight for Steve Williams, who's battling for his life in uh, Louisiana. He has throat cancer, and uh, he's battling for it. So he's in need of each and every one of your prayers out there. But all of our money was on him, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Death got, uh, got nailed by Bart and pulled his hamstring and was unable to uh, compete for quite a while. And then, uh, of course, Butterbean and uh, Bart, uh, what a shocker it was. Uh, uh, but, you know, in a situation like that, Butterbean only agreed to it uh, if it was on their feet. So I think it took an element away from what we do best, and that's wrestling, what Bart could do best was, was wrestle and brawl. So he more or less was, uh, was handcuffed with the stipulation that he had to, uh, had to uh, fight. Uh, box and uh, that wasn't his expertise so uh, it, was, it was a shocker but yet you know the Butterbean wanted his own game he didn't win at our game uh, and I give Bart Gunn a lot of credit for going out for a big professional like he, like he did and uh, he dearly paid for it uh, for his uh, Peter and uh, Kurt Angle uh, Kurt Angle is an Olympic gold medalist and what a lot of fans fail to realize that uh, Kurt's suffered two broken necks in the last year strength in his arms are next to none and he had competed against an, uh, another young man a little bit earlier in the evening and uh, Kurt by the time uh, then Peter got in, had no feeling whatsoever in his in his fingers or hands so he was kind of handicapped going into that bout also but uh, uh, you know like I said you know another star is born Ron Gott from Kingsport Tennessee I have a two part question for Jack first of all Back in the late 60s, you competed a lot over in Japan or a fair deal over in Japan. How would you compare the style of Japanese wrestling with that of American wrestling? And number two, what are your some of your memories of the great Malenko, a man that you were in ring with several times over in that period? Let's start with Japan. What are your memories of wrestling in Japan? I have great memories of wrestling in Japan, but the first time I went over there, I was a rookie. And uh, the Japanese uh, style over there is the... Uh, Japanese stars, uh, they're, they're the, the stars, they're the top people, and, and the, the new guys and the, uh, the, the rookies are the ones that have to carry everybody's bag over there and, and uh, uh, carry everybody's bag for, through the Air Force and, and almost force their feet when the matches are over. And so they're, uh, the Japanese younger guys are very tough and they're, they're very determined and uh, they believe in saving face. So anytime you get in the ring with those younger guys, you was gonna have to fight for your life, literally, against those guys. And uh, the Japanese fans were very different because they didn't scream and cheer uh, like the fans you here in the United States do. They would sit on the floor and they were very polite. And when they would, you would make a good move that they liked, they would just give you, a, a, you know, a golf clap. Yeah. And so if the the style was just different because they kept it closer to the ground. They didn't do as much flying as we do here. And uh, I shouldn't say we. <laughs> we. <laughs> but it was, it was very different. But uh, Japan is a wonderful country. Uh, uh, some great athletes over there, great wrestlers. And uh, I took many, many trips over there. And I love Japan. And I love competing with, uh, with the Japanese guys. Yes, uh, my name is Steve Fry. I'm on the staff here for the Fan Fest. Uh, this is for Jack. Um, during the time that you were world champion, you said that you know you had to be a traveling champion, and you made many appearances in different territories and regions, all you know within a matter of a, a week. Um, was there any time that you feared before you went to the ring in a different territory, you know, that maybe the swerve might be on that night since you were the world champion? And if there was any time that you thought that, could you know maybe elaborate on it? Did you ever worry about a double cross, someone trying to steal the title? Uh, not really. Uh, uh, you'd get in different situations where uh, guys would uh, they'd be a little jealous of you, and then they'd want to lean on you a little bit, or or they might have a referee set on their side to give them a, a definite benefit, but. Uh, I felt like I could handle any situation, and uh, if it came up, I felt like I could handle it. 
Jack was asked this question in an online chat one time, and I thought he had the best answer ever. They knew better. <laughs> I can't run that fast. Anybody on this side have a question? There you go. Just your comments and thoughts on your work with Paul Jones, not only here in Midland, but in Florida, and the, uh, the program you ran with him. And yeah, uh, Paul, I, I'm the one to talk Paul in to come to, to uh, Florida to, to work with me down there. And Paul came down there, much like Jerry and I, when we uh, worked with Steamboat and Youngblood here, we'd never worked with Hills, and Paul had never worked at the Hill when, uh, when he came to Florida. And uh, I was the uh, Florida Headways ch uh, champion, of course, and. Uh, uh, we put the belt on Paul and had a tremendous run down there, and the first time Paul ever worked heel, and Paul was a natural, and that's why I tried to talk him into coming down there. I knew Paul would be a great heel, and he, he picked it up. Just it was just a natural for him, and we had a we had a great run down there, and uh, just really enjoyed working with Paul. He was a great great uh, professional. Uh, second question is for both of you. Um, were there any ever consideration thoughts? Uh, from yourself, promoters, or whatever, to ever pit you two against each other in the ring? Good question. Have anybody ever tried to talk you into doing a brother versus brother feud or a brother versus brother match? Uh, just, I think one time Dory Funk Sr. kind of suggested it, but we were so young at the time, it was not the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, it's uh, just another way the funk had to be one of us, I think. <laughs> But no, uh, uh, you know, things were totally different back in those days. I just, you know, I, I backstage, yeah, there were a few times when we were uh, upset with each other, mostly him upset with me, and because uh, I'd made a mistake or something out there. Uh, uh, but uh, to my recollection, uh, I think Dory Buck Sr. was uh, mentioned it back early, early in our careers. I have one more question about Paul Jones. Jack, as many times as you've taken Paul to lunch, as many times that you've been in a bar and you bought Paul a beer, how disappointing is it that you can never get Paul to pick up a round? Well, yeah, that's just Paul. You know, he is from <laughs> Texas, and you know how those Texans are. Uh, Paul's never bought me a beer in all the 30 years that I've known him. He has very short arms. <laughs> Jack, this is a two-part question for you. Back in the mid-late 70s, there was a match on TV with your brother Jerry against Tony Russo. Piper had notified one of the promoters that she had a phone call, and Piper jumped off the ropes and uh, shattered Russo and Jerry's leg at the time. Later, you and Steamboat had teamed up for a little bit. I want to know first, were they giving you and Steamboat consideration for the tag titles? And the second part, I saw you in a match with Flair on TV where you pinned him in a non-title match. Were they building you up to become world champion again? First question first, any talk about keeping you and Steamboat together as a team and maybe getting you a tag title run? No, I believe at the time that Youngblood was injured and that uh, Steamboat needed a partner and so Crockett wanted to put me with him, but uh, they never really seriously considered uh, keeping us together permanently, no. And Jack, after you dropped the world title, I, you had some nice runs as a challenger. Did you have any desire, or was there ever any consideration of you getting the belt back? Oh yeah, when uh, we, uh, when the Flair put me over in the non-title match for the, for the championship belt, uh, no, they was very happy with Flair at the time, and they wanted Flair to stay champion. And we were just, uh, we got the, the thing on tape so we could show it in different spots, uh, uh, different Florida and St. Louis, and Japan, and throughout the uh, mid-Atlantic here, uh, just to help us draw money. Hi, my name is Brenda Hudeman. I'm from Chesapeake, Virginia. And I was wondering about ladies wrestling. Are there any seriously, are they gonna be seriously taken, taken at any time <laughs> soon? And are, are there any strong ones out there that are there going to be a more legitimate women's division, and are there any women out there that you respect as wrestlers, that you like as wrestlers? You 
know, uh, coming up in, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic area, you know, you always had the penny banners and, and the, the fabulous moolahs and the, and the great, great women competitors, uh, Tony uh, Starson, uh, Donna Christotello, I mean, this just goes on and on, Judy Marks, and all these great, great women competitors who, who raised the bar and who set a standard and uh, who had it really rough in no matter where they traveled. And, we thought we as men had it rough traveling, but these ladies would, would travel all over the United States. They'd come into an area for a week or, or two weeks, and then they'd pack their bags and head off somewhere else. So they were constantly on the road, but they set the standard for uh, years and years uh, for these young ladies to follow. And do I think uh, they had the ability to compete on that level? Probably yes, but do I think uh, that's the way it'll go back to? I don't think so because once again, I, I don't think the majority of fans want to see it right now. And, and I wish that they did. And uh, even our ladies that compete, uh, believe it or not, they would like nothing better to be on that level. And uh, when we have uh, Mae Young and the Fabulous Moolah make a guest appearance on the WWE, um, which is always tremendous. And, and these two ladies, I mean, God knows their age, and but they, these two ladies are, are still out there competing. And, and they were in the semifinal on the first dog fight on the arc. Exactly. And they, <laughs> I'll tell Mula you said that. Uh, definitely Johnny May Young. <laughs> she knows where you live. But uh, these young ladies, when these two women walk in, and not only the young ladies, but the young men, uh, we flock to those ladies because of the tremendous amount of respect. And they, they walk into an arena, and every one of these young competitors nowadays go over and thank these two ladies for everything that they contributed to the business. And, uh, you know, the Penny Banners of the world and, and the Moolahs and the May, May Youngs, they'll never be forgotten. And, and, and uh, like I said, they set, set the bar so high that, uh, that it's going to be awful hard for some of these young ladies to follow. Hi, I'm Bobby Ariakes. Um Looking at the results back from 82, 83, um, when, this is for you, Jerry, you were mainly in prelims, a lot of opening bouts, too. And I've noticed that, like, on March 13th of 83, when uh, they had the Slaughter and Carnival Steamboat and Young Blood match, you were in the opening match. And then, like, two months later, you two were both in the main event against Steamboat and Young Blood. So my question is, was there any... Um, dissension between you and the other guys that were in the opening bouts for your immediate main event status where maybe they might have thought they should have moved up a few steps in the ranks either before you or with you where they stayed behind and you went on to the main events uh, I don't you know I can't speak for uh, for them but uh, I know that at that time I was, I was coming into mid-atlantic from uh, a long uh, is from uh, Mid-Atlantic, and uh, basically when you come into a, a new place, uh, no matter who you are, you kind of start on the ground level and work yourself up, but, uh, you know, I, I hope there wasn't, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, like any other business, there's always jealousies and always people who, uh, who want to jump ahead of you, and, and uh, if you make that jump, uh, uh, I certainly don't think it was given to me, I think I earned it, and, uh, and I, I hope that the people that same way. Yeah, my name is uh, Doug Rafferty. Uh, one's a question. Uh, first off, Jack, you were kind of uh, basically given the uh, nod as to turn in Dusty Rhodes' face in one of your NWA title matches. Um, Dusty acknowledged it on one of the shoot interviews. It was a match with you that actually turned him face. Uh, one, can you, do you remember anything about that night? And two, I think everybody here will agree with me all the titles that you've won, all the stuff you've done for tag team wrestling and the world heavyweight title. When you get to get in the Hall of Fame for the WWE, when they're going to acknowledge you for it? First things first, do you remember, what do you remember the night that you wrestled Dusty and basically turned Dusty babyface? Yeah, I was in... Uh, uh, Miami Beach is where it happened, and uh, uh, of course the Florida fans have been behind me for years, uh, uh, pushing me to win the World's Heavyweight uh, Championship, and I finally won it. 
and uh, I'd had it for quite a while. And Dusty was uh, building himself at the time in Florida as the American Dream. And even though he was still uh, healed, he was still on the verge of the fans loved him anyway. Half the fans uh, loved him, half of them hated him. So when I had the title on the line against him, of course, everybody wants to see the champion get beat. We were wrestling in, in uh, Miami, so I had knocked Dusty down, and he fell kind of into the ropes, and the referee went to push me back, and I went around <coughs> Dusty, and I dropped a knee on him, and the place just exploded. Everybody booing me, and I thought that they all wanted to kill me. So it, was, uh, it came a shock that both Dusty and I were just kind of just just looked at it, and I said, oh man, we just got something going here. And uh, we just went on with it, and that's how Dusty turned babyface. Jack, do you know anybody high level in the WWE that might help you make your case to get in the WWE Hall of Fame? Yeah, I do, but he wears a dress. A couple of honors that Jack is going to be receiving in 2005, to, uh, two things that he's very proud of. First of all, at the Cauliflower Alley Club reunion in Las Vegas, which will be the 40th reunion this year, Lou Thez, before his death, selected five wrestlers that he wanted, that he felt represented professional wrestling in the way he wanted represented. Last year, Danny Hodge was the, one of the men that Lou picked. And next year, Jack Briscoe will receive that honor hand-picked from the great Lou Thez. Thank you. And also in Schenectady, New York, the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame organization in 2005 will honor Jack Briscoe. Absolutely. That was about three years ago. Yes. And will, and the first brother combination to ever be inducted into the Luthez George Tragos Pro, uh, Professional Wrestling Amateur Wrestling Hall of Fame in Newton, Iowa. Jack Briscoe about three years ago and in 2005, Gerald Briscoe. <laughs> and that's a little bit different Hall of Fame and if I can get your thoughts on that, because what makes that Hall of Fame different is not only do you have to have a great professional career, but you have to have a legitimate amateur background. And I'd like to get, Gerald, let's start with you since you're the new inductee. Is that special compared to the other honors that you've received as a professional wrestler? Uh, yes, it is. It's, it's a tremendous honor. And uh, I was sitting at home and uh, Bill Murdoch uh, is a dear friend of my brother's and a, and a great friend of myself. So called me and told me of the honor, and uh, I was overwhelmed. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, Mark, it's not only for your professional wrestling part of it, but your, your amateur career also. And uh, it's, it uh, left me almost speechless, and Jack knows for me to be speechless <laughs> when somebody stands out there, it's, it's kind of strange, but uh, it, it was, it's, it's an overwhelming honor that, that you were considered and that you were nominated and, and accepted and voted into any type of Hall of Fame, especially a Hall of Fame that bears Luthez's name, who is uh, the, the father of uh, all of what we try to do. And Jack, what did it mean to you three years ago when you were inducted in the same class as Tim Woods? Well, it was a great thrill for me because not only the museum is named after Lou, but that night, of course, Lou was still alive at the time, and Lou presented me with the award, so it was extra special to me because Lou Thez was my idol and the man that made me want to become a professional wrestler, so it was very special to me. question is, I guess more or less to Jerry, um, I know back in the day uh, when y'all were around in the NWA and all, the uh, interviews were short and sweet and there really wasn't a whole lot of run-ins to interfering with matches, but there were some from time to time, but it seems that now uh, that's all you see is 
interviews, 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 and run-ins. Um, is it just the way that Vince and the other people want to do things, or could it be that, you know, or is it just um, a lack of wanting to put people on TV <coughs> and seeing interviews instead of wrestling? That's, that's a very, very good question and a very true statement. Uh, Back in the old days, we had an hour of TV, so everything had to be short, precise, and right to the point. And you know, you had 90 seconds to deliver your promo, and you're on to the match. And you, you had some time to tell a story in the match and all this. And uh, now we have two hours twice a week, and uh, and sometimes uh, with pay per view, we have six hours, and it's a lot of wrestling, a lot of lot of a lot of a uh, lot of uh, time that you have to fill. And uh, unfortunately, we've got into a lot of talk. And uh, and do I wish it was the other way? Yeah, but once again, uh, you people have the power to speak up and have to have the power to change it and uh, keep speaking up. And uh, and but uh, you know, it's it's the evolution of the business. Uh, did either of you guys ever book during your career? No. Uh, yeah, briefly uh, in Florida Championship Wrestling with Dusty and a little bit in, uh, in uh, WWE also. And, uh, and so uh, I try to hand at it and, uh, and enjoy doing it. And it's a, it's a time-consuming job and a very demanding job. And uh, the guys who take on that responsibility, uh, uh, I know Rip Hawk was in here earlier and uh, he was a tremendous uh, booker and, and devoted his life to it. And, uh, there's a lot of dedicated people that do that. Dick Bourne, you're going to ask two questions and you're not going to put over your website? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, although we have a website, that, the Mid-Atlantic Gateway, that pays tribute to all the hard work that you guys did and your peers, and we appreciate you very much. I will ask Jack one more question. Um, on your shoot interview tape, I guess you did with Mark. Which is available this weekend. <laughs> okay. uh, a few years back. When Mark asked you about turning heel and you just got this twinkle in your eye and, and a smile on your face, and uh, it's almost a rhetorical question, but uh, which did you did you like better, heel or, uh, or baby face? Oh, I like the baby face the best because uh, 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 my brother gets all the girls. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, both both parts were fun and uh, it was just a lot of fun, but uh, Jerry and I have done it gone our whole career just uh, strictly as uh, faces, and uh, we both agreed that you know, we wanted to, uh, before our career was over, to have a good run or maybe even turn, uh, you know, permanently. But uh, we had a great run with uh, Young Blood and Steamboat, and uh, it, it does bring a twinkle to my eye because uh, those are two of my favorite people and uh, two of my uh, favorite wrestlers, and we just had a wonderful time. It was lots of fun. I know for me, I've always enjoyed being being a heel, and uh, and uh, you know, it's just just for some reason uh, it, it fit me. You know? <laughs> but we also also had the opportunity when we were quite younger, when we would go into Texas and being from Oklahoma, it was a natural rivalry when we'd wrestle the Funks uh, in Texas. We'd we'd get uh, get everything in the arena thrown at us, and uh, just. If I got time, Mark, just a little, little side story. I was, uh, uh, we were there wrestling the Funk Brothers, and all of a sudden, all these cowboys got a little hot at us, uh, started calling us names and jumping in the ring. The next thing you know, there are about 50 guys in the ring, cowboy hats and boots, and they're all swinging, throwing kicks and punches at us. And I'm over in the corner fighting for my life, and Jack's over there. Jack, what do we do? About that time, we looked over in the corner of our eyes, and we saw this guy coming out with a big, long chain. Just twirling around, clearing a path. He says, stay close to Killer. Killer Carl Cox is coming to a rescue. <laughs> and thank goodness for KKK that night because he saved our lives. Boy, <laughs> those Texans were hot, but they, they respected Cox so much, especially that six-foot-long chain that they cleared away for us. Did Dick Murdoch switch shoe heel for one night in Dallas during his ring introduction? Dick Murdoch switched a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's referring to the, uh, I think, the 105th time Oklahoma beat Texas in football. I, mean, I think that's it. 
you guys are wrestling a reunion arena against Adonis and Murdoch, and it was the Friday night before Texas, Oklahoma. And Murdoch and Adonis, since they're the heels, they come to the ring first. And Murdoch commandeers the microphone, as Murdoch was apt to do at times, and goes, it's great to be back in the ring center, Texas! Because who wants to see Texas beat Oklahoma tomorrow? Yay! Who wants to see a couple of Okies get their ass kicked right now? <laughs> That's all it took. <laughs> Nobody accused those Texans of being smart. Too. <laughs> Uh, for a second, I'd like to put over the Thez Tragos Hall of Fame in Newton, Iowa. Um, Newton's a very small town in the center of Iowa, about 25 miles east of Des Moines. It's a great experience. If you have any interest in learning about amateur wrestling and its history, it's phenomenal. I encourage you strongly to stop there. It, it is. It's a wonderful place. And what we have failed to uh, leave out is it has uh, all the great amateurs, uh, all the great amateur Hall of Fame members in there also. and also has a wing. Of course, everybody knows that Oklahoma's the best in amateur wrestling. Iowa is the second best. They also have a wing where they have all the great Iowa wrestlers in the wing, and it's a wonderful place. And if you ever in through uh, Des Moines or Newton, Iowa, please stop in and see the museum. We're about to have a riot between all the Dan Gable fans and all the Danny Hodge fans. <laughs> My question actually involves amateur wrestling. Um, you mentioned kind of keeping an eye out for indie performers that uh, might catch your eye. Are there any amateurs that you feel might have an aptitude for the, for the professional ranks, specifically people like Rulon Gardner, Cale Sanderson, and Kerry McCoy? Uh, three great individuals. Uh, I had uh, Rulon Gardner as my guest in uh, Phoenix, Arizona about two months ago, right, uh, right after the Olympics. And uh, Rulon spent the day with the WWE tour and the backstage going to the production truck and seeing how the production people put things together. He was quite impressed. And uh, Rulon is, is a devout Mormon, and uh, he had a meeting with his church and decided that this avenue at this time was not the, the best, uh, best road for him to take. Uh, and I respect that decision, respect his religion. And Rulon Gardner is a first class young man. And, a tremendous asset to the United States of America, and I'm very proud of his effort. And uh, he beat King Kong, and nobody had ever beaten uh, Korean in his life. And uh, and Rulon did it, and brought great credit to Greco Roman in the United States. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, Kel Sanderson, uh, to me, uh, the third greatest wrestler of all time. Uh, 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 Jack and I was privileged to uh, what I consider the greatest wrestler of all time, being teammates with him. Uh, Joe Yutaki, who was uh, an undefeated amateur wrestler for Oklahoma State, won two Olympic uh, gold medals, and of course Danny Hodge and Jack Briscoe himself. But uh, Kel Sanderson was a guest of mine in Des Moines, Iowa, the last time, uh, just a month or so ago, right after he returned from the Olympics. Uh, came in for a look see and brought his wife and uh, his, uh, some of his friends in. And uh, Kel's a first class young man, too, and I'd give anything if. Uh, if he decided to turn uh, this direction, but uh, Kel uh, is a, is a, is great on the amateur scene and wants to continue on that amateur scene, and uh, he's such a great influence in today's uh, American youth that d does compete in uh, amateur wrestling, and uh, the world looks up to him, and uh, I respect whatever his decision may be. Uh, as far as uh, looking out there, I don't know a lot of people are aware, but there was a, a Greco-Roman 215-pounder who, uh, that's the weight class that Kurt Angle uh, won from Egypt, uh, uh, Karen Grabber, and uh, it was just loaded with charisma. I brought him into Cleveland, Ohio uh, a few months before the Olympics um, to give him a look-see, and he's a natural at uh, what we do. Uh, but when he won the gold, it was the first gold that Egypt had captured in 75 years in any sport. And uh, needless to say, when he returned to Egypt, he was treated like uh, treated like the, the legend that he should be over there. And uh, uh, oil companies and everything else have offered him money. And he's a young man's only 23 years old, so they want him to continue to compete for the, their country of Egypt and uh, going to reward him, which is unfortunate. The United States of America doesn't treat. Uh, they're Olympic athletes like uh, like the European country street. Uh, but Corinne is in the future for the WWE, and uh, he, I've had several conversations since he won the gold, and uh, it's something he wants to pursue, uh, you know, at the later stage of his life. And uh, 
when he comes, everybody's in for a treat with this young man. He's just a phenomenal competitor. Yeah, uh, my question's for Jack and Jerry both. Uh, before you guys had your program with Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood, in Florida, you guys kind of flirted with the heel turn with Mike Graham and Steve Kern. Uh, can you uh, tell me a little bit about that? And also, um, what was Jack, uh, I heard some story about you having some sort of role in bringing Ricky Steamboat into professional wrestling down in Florida or something to that. But was there some sort of role that you and Eddie Graham or somebody kind of helped Ricky along the way? Actually, it was in West Palm Beach and uh, I had never seen uh, uh, Ricky before. And that's when uh, Jerry was uh, uh, helping book Florida. And uh, we were in West Palm Beach, and we were there kind of early, and Jerry came in and says, have you seen the kid over in the other dressing room? I said, no, I haven't been over yet. He says, you got to come take a look at this kid. This, uh, he's a, he's a fine-looking specimen. He, he, he looks like, uh, you know, well, he could really be something in this business. So Jerry knew right away, so I walked in there, and I took one look at him. I said, my God, this kid's got something going for him. And I asked him the name, he said, Richard Blood. I said, my God, we gotta do something about your name right now. We can't let you go out there with Richard Blood. <laughs> by that time, Eddie come over and I said, Eddie, come here. I took him over and I said, look at this kid here. He said, oh my God. I said, Eddie, we need to find a good name for him. And Eddie was uh, tag team partners with Sam Steamboat from, uh, from uh, Hawaii. And Eddie said, man, he looks like Sam Steamboat. I said, yeah, that sounds good. Let's call him Ricky Steamboat. Rick Steamboat was born. I recently had a conversation. <laughs> I recently had a conversation with uh, Ricky, and Ricky tells a, 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 a fascinating, funny story about that situation. Uh, in the program, of course, he was listed as Richard Blood from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is actually from St. Petersburg, Florida. And so while he was in the ring, uh, you know, he was out there and. Uh, ring announcer at that time, he announced the competitors when they were in the ring, not as they were coming to the ring. So they announced Ricky's opponent. And in this corner, from Minneapolis, uh, uh, from Hawaii, uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, Ricky Steamboat. And Ricky said, looking around, you know, <laughs> trying to, you know, who is this guy, who is this guy? The announcer kind of puts the bike down and uh, you announcers out there know what I'm talking about. That's you, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, smile and wave, Rick. Oh, oh, it's me. <laughs> How you doing? You know, he still didn't get it. You know, but he finally he did. He ever get it when he got it. <laughs> I, my name is Brian, and I'm from Enos, North Carolina. And um, everybody agrees that you had great matches with Steamboat and Youngblood and Donis and Murdoch. Um, this is kind of a hard question, but um, unfortunately, um, Youngblood and Murdoch and Adonis are no longer with us. So I was wondering, how does it make you feel as a wrestler to know that guys that you worked with in the past are, you know, have passed on? And are you shocked that a lot of the wrestlers that we grew up watching um, are dying at a young age? Yes, it's very sad. And um, of course, anytime you lose a friend, uh, it, it's a very sad situation. And uh, of course, uh, Murdoch, uh, unfortunately, passed away of a heart attack. Just some of those things that happen, of course, and uh, it's unfortunate that a lot of people know our, our people in the business, and I'm sure in, the, in, uh, in your way of life, I'm sure a lot of your friends and relatives pass away at one time or another young. It's just unfortunate that people know our people, and when they, when they do pass away, we get a lot of publicity, and uh, unfortunately, it's some of it's for the wrong, wrong reasons. You know, it's just unfortunate. I just uh, echo that, you know, we, we go up and down the road uh, with each other and uh, we battle each other and we, we, we spend a lot of time on the road and, and unfortunately sometimes, in, you know, in the old territorial days, you'd spend more time on the road with, with the people that you work with than, than your loved ones at home and uh, you, you form a special relationship with, with the guys that you compete against and uh, the guys you mentioned were guys that we competed against quite a bit and uh, and it's you know it, it's always shocking when you hear it and you just you know pray to God that it doesn't happen again and uh, you know and bless their families and uh, and you know just think of the fond memories that we had and each and every one of you those names that you mentioned probably can recall a, a great match that one of those guys have and that's the way we like to look at it you know just recall the good times with them and uh, and uh, praise them for that. Two questions for Jerry. Uh, one, <clears throat> at 
at Survivor Series 97, when Brett screwed Brett, do you think that the right decision was made? I, absolutely, uh, I do. Uh, I think it was the right decision. Uh, I, I had a tremendous amount of respect for Bret Hart. Uh, I didn't share his beliefs that he was the superstar that he thought he was, but I thought he was a, a gigantic superstar, and I thought he was an asset to the business. And for someone whose father had gone through all the hardships that his father had gone through in Calgary Championship Wrestling, trying to get talent in and out of there and trying to get talent to do the right thing and being brought up with that type of mentality and knowing the sacrifices that his father had to make and his family had to make and uh, and and knowing the ins and outs of, of the business uh, as Brett knew, uh, you know, and of course he feels entirely different that he did make a mistake and. Uh, and I look back upon that with no regrets and uh, and honestly feel that it was the right thing and the only thing to do at that time. Bill, I've got to answer letters from another Calgary gun column. <laughs> do you feel that when people like Bruno San Martino or Hulk Hogan or even Bret Hart spend years burying the WWE and Vince and his wondrous ways, do you think they even deserve the opportunity to come back and make money from you all? Uh, <laughs> I've kind of fidgeted my seat up here. Uh, do I feel like, uh, uh, you know, through all Vince McMahon's faults, and we all have a lot of, a lot of negatives to us, if there's one thing Vince McMahon always tells everybody that works very closely to him, Everybody's entitled to a second chance. Sometimes everybody's entitled to a third chance. And Vince is a very unforgiving man in that manner. Uh, believe it or not, he is a, a very thoughtful man and a very forgiving man. And uh, he's one of these guys that never say never, no matter what the situation is. If he feels that's what the fans really want and that's what the fans demand, then Vince will swallow his pride and bring somebody in like that and uh, the guys you mentioned uh, of course Hulk Hogan is very close to Jack and myself we were instrumental in getting him into the uh, into the wrestling business and getting him into the WWE uh, you know and, and the things and, and I consider Hulk Hogan as the forerunner and the pioneer that led the charge that changed professional wrestling and for better or worse he brought it out on a giant stage, a worldwide global stage. And through him and Vince, Vince's creativity and Terry's ability and his charisma changed the world that we all love. And I think they changed it uh, for the better. Would I like to see more matches? Yeah, but do I have a respect for Hulk Hogan for what he did and how he broadened the audience of professional wrestling and how he brought it to the mainstream? And I truly believe without a Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon, there would have been no rock, there would have been no uh, superstar uh, uh, Billy Graham, there'd be uh, no uh, Bret Hart's or Shawn Michaels or anybody like that. So I, I think the business changed. Uh, I like what it's changed, uh, the perception of it, you know, that, uh, that it's entertainment. Uh, we are entertainment, we were entertainers back when Jack and I were in the ring. It was just a different form of entertainment. They've taken it to a gigantic level, and uh, and I think deep down inside, uh, a lot of people sitting in here respect that and, and, and enjoy it, and uh, I certainly can hold my head up high and, and proud that I work with an organization like that, that, uh, that a man will give uh, somebody a second, third chance, and uh, that's the way it goes, and that's the way uh, Mr. McMahon operates. How you doing? Uh, Mike Mann, Boston Mass. I'd just like to know both your gentlemen's thoughts on working the old Boston Gardens. The old Boston Gardens. Oh, I love the old Boston Gardens. There was some wild and crazy people up there. And the uh, first time I went up there, I was uh, uh, worked with, uh, what was one of the Japanese guys? I'm so crazy. Fuji. Worked with Fuji. Fuji is one of the craziest guys that ever lived. And I remember around the ring, the fans there were so crazy that big, huge plexiglass 
people all around on all four sides of the ring because people threw so much stuff at the ring they had, they had the plexiglass up there to keep them from throwing trash in there. But it was a great place, and because uh, I was a big Larry Bird fan, so it meant a lot to me to wrestle in the same place Larry Bird had uh, played basketball. <laughs> and for me, uh, you know, a lot of places that you walk into have so much history, and there, there's so much ambiance about the the venue itself, and a lot of people don't realize that, that when you go into a place, you know, it's, it's, it's an arena, and some of them are cold, damp, and you know, it's just, you go in, you work, and you get out, but I tell you what, when my brother and I walked out, and there were 17,000 people in that screaming, and that garden just screaming, it was summertime, it was hotter than Hades in that arena, but you just got that en energy, then you got in that ring, and you happen to look up, and you see all those banners up there, all those banners, Boston Celtics, Boston Bruins and everything, and all those great champions that have been in that arena, and you were able to share what they had experienced in there. It, it brought a different level and it brought your competition up. And to me, you know, Madison Square Garden was a great place, Boston Garden for the Northeast. Uh, wow, what, a, what an experience to go in that place. Um, you guys were talking about uh, bringing Hogan did you ever imagine that he would take off like he did? Yeah, I really did. The uh, first time I went, laid eyes on him, I knew that he was a, a, a superstar, would uh, go to places in this business that had never been gone before because he was such a hard worker and uh, worked out so hard. And, and he was a sacrifice, did a lot of sacrifices, uh, uh, did the right nutrition, uh, took his vitamins and said his <laughs> prayers. <laughs> But uh, he did all the right things at a very young age, and uh, he just had so much charisma. <laughs> he had so much charisma, we all knew he was going to be a star. When, uh, I will never forget the first night he wrestled with him in Vero Beach, uh, Florida. And uh, Jerry and uh, Pat Patterson and myself happened to be there that night, and he was in the opening match, and uh, we wanted to see what, how the fans would react to him that first night. So uh, on the opening match, so our fans are all sitting there waiting for the matches. Eight o'clock comes, and uh, we sent out the, the heel first, and then here comes out Hulk Hogan, which was uh, Terry Belay at the time. And by the time that he got to the ring, people were ooh and ah and standing their feet and cheering before he ever got to the ring on his first match. And said, "And I think the star is born." Was there something unusual that happened? During a pole battle royal, <laughs> you asked for me. <laughs> well, me. <laughs> uh, you, you you're talking about with Mike Graham. Yes. <laughs> uh, we're gonna let you in on a little little of the shenanigans that go on backstage, which makes life easier for us on the road. Uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the pole battle raw where you put the envelope up on top and the first man who climbs the pole uh, wins whatever's in the envelope. It's usually a blank piece of paper. <laughs> you know? uh, $50,000 battle roll tonight, you know, and there's a $50 payoff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all bored sitting backstage. It's a Saturday night, you know, we're sitting there and trying to think of something mysterious and I don't know that. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, uh, anyway, one of us come up with the idea. Let's Vaseline that pole tonight. <laughs> 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 so uh, we sneak, or we somebody sneaks in the back and uh, finds the pole and gets a jar of Vaseline and rubs that pole down, baby. Where Superman could climb that pole. <laughs> So everybody's out there, they strap that pole up, everybody comes to the ring for some unknown reason. My brother and I are eliminated real early that we don't even attempt to, to climb the pole. <laughs> and, uh, there's a couple of guys left in here, one of them being Mike Graham, who was uh, going to win the big $50,000 prize that night. <laughs> and I was a part of my assignment, I was helping to do the book there in that, uh, that uh, territory at that time. And uh, so we greased down the pole and uh, Finally, it came down to the last three or four guys. They started shimmying up that pole as fast as they were shimmying up. They were sliding down. It was like a cartoon character. 
And uh, finally, you know, it was Mike and another guy, and, uh, and then Mike knocks the guy down, he goes to shimmy up, and Mike slides down, he goes to shimmy up again, slides down. And pretty soon you can see Mike grabbing his forearms. His forearms are so blown up, so cramped up, we're trying to grab all of that pole, squeeze that pole, get up there, he can't do it. And I look at Jack, oh my God, I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> Pan Panic was setting in about this time. We're watching from the back. Yeah, but we, Jerry goes running to the ring, to the pole. <laughs> I had to run out there, Mike, get on my shoulders, get on my shoulders. And Mike got on my shoulders, I boosted him, I grabbed him, and I ran back out like nobody had ever seen me. That's the reason healing is so natural to me. <laughs> Just one, one real quick question. Um, when you, there was a comment you said about superstar Billy Graham. If it wasn't for Hogan, Graham wouldn't be there. Um, Actually, Graham came along a lot sooner than Hogan. And if he would have been given his props, basically, and left him run, left the run with the title, do you think there would have been the explosion that happened in the mid-'80s before Hogan? They would have kept Graham with the belt? If superstar Billy Graham had stayed on top in the WWE longer, would he had gotten over as big as over as Hogan had? Well, I think there's a reason he didn't stay up there longer because they was wanting to go in a different direction. Uh, while he was there, he did a good job, but he never drew the big, big money that uh, Hulk Hogan drew, and he never had created the absolute uh, enthusiasm and excitement at every age level that, that Hogan uh, represented. And um, they had other people that drew money, just as much money and created as much excitement as superstar Billy Graham did at the time. I think Jack hit it right on the nail that uh, that uh, Terry uh, Hulk Hogan appealed to a different style of audience, uh, appealed to the young, middle aged, and old age, and er everybody in between. And uh, that superstar had his had his run there, and uh, I think he was very charismatic. And I think Hogan copied a lot of what superstar Billy Graham does. But in essence, we're all thieves. We all copy what the other guys do, and just try to make it our own. And Hogan was able to capture not only uh, 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 superstar Billy Graham, but Thunderbolt Patterson, and one of my uh, great partners here in the Mid-Atlantic, Thunderbolt Patterson, who to me was the forerunner of, of the great promos. Uh, Thunderbolt, you know, y'all remember Thunderbolt could talk you, uh, talk you blue in the face, and uh, I think Dusty Rhodes kind of copped that uh, from uh, Thunderbolt, and then uh, between him and Superstar, I think Hogan kind of evolved it, but they just took what Thunderbolt Patterson started and, and uh, evolved it into uh, the Hulkamania, brother. Uh, my name's Nancy Taylor, and I'm from Waysboro. I got a question for Jerry, and you just started answering it when you're talking about T-Bolt. Besides your brother, who were some of your favorite partners, either Mid-Atlantic or Georgia or Florida? Of course, uh, Jack is always number one because he's my brother, but uh, Thunderbolt Patterson was, was a great partner uh, and uh, really helped me rise above, you know, rise to the top. Uh, being team with Thunderbolt, he was so charismatic and, and, and just so outspoken, and it was so unusual uh, in the early 70s for uh, uh, a white guy and a black guy to be tag team partners, and that I think the appeal of that in itself was very, very unique and something I was very proud of that uh, that I was tag team partners with a, with a great Afro-American man and a, a guy that I respected very much and traveling around, uh, you know, as I said earlier, you become very close and, and, and bonded to guys that you, that you travel with and Thunderbolt was uh, definitely uh, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, of course, Big Don Morocco, the, the crazy Hawaiian, wow. <laughs> Uh, we had a lot of great times, and we were tag team champions in Georgia and Florida, and uh, Don was not only one of my favorite tag team partners, but one of my best friends all, all of all time. And, uh, uh, but uh, those two there, I think uh, Thunderbolt, Sandy Scott, one of the greatest legends of Mid-Atlantic wrestling, uh, the guy uh, when Rip Hawk uh, helped me get into uh, Mid-Atlantic wrestling, uh, I was able to team up with Sandy Scott, who had just uh, his brother had gone on to Dallas and wanted to pursue booking and things like that, which we're all glad he did because when George became Booker here in the Mid-Atlantic, he set this place on fire and made it uh, 
the most popular place in the world for a professional wrestler to come. But uh, uh, Sandy Scott, Thunderbolt Patterson, and Don Morocco were probably my three favorite uh, ones that bring back the best memories of. You also had a run in Georgia with Bob Backlund, didn't you? Yeah, Bobby Backlund was, was a great partner, and uh, uh, he, he was, Bobby Backlund was, was uh, howdy doody. <laughs> <laughs> he was a character in itself, and he didn't realize he was a character at that time, but uh, yeah, I had a great run. Bobby was a lot of fun to be with, and uh, we always tried our best. Uh, another little match story, inside story here, that uh, Bobby and I were tag team partners against uh, Bob Orton Jr., Randy Orton's father, and uh, Dick Slater. So kind of before the match, let's see if we can blow up Bobby Backlund, which, you know, blowing up Bobby Backlund, blowing up means making him tired in the ring. It was second uh, impossible to do. You just couldn't do it. So that night, every time Bobby or uh, Backlund would come to tag me, I'd just take a walk down the uh, down the aisleway there, and I was never there for the tag, and they were switching in and out. and. They never blew him up. <laughs> when Backlund finally got to me, he slapped my hand so hard, I thought he slapped it over in the next county. <laughs> it's been very difficult, but I think we've come pretty close into capturing 50 years worth of professional wrestling experience into a two-hour question and answer. Jack and Jerry Briscoe, of course, the one of only two brother combinations to be both world tag team champions and world singles champion to the National Wrestling Alliance. Congratulations on a spectacular career. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight. Give it up for Jack and Jerry Briscoe. Thank you all for coming. And I wish all of you a very happy holidays. Thank you. I'd just like to thank all the fans here at the Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Uh, Bob Cottle, I don't know if he's here now, but Bob Cottle, you guys were blessed with some of the greatest commentators in the world. Uh, Big Bill Ward, who was here when I first came in here. Bob Cottle, who was the voice of Mid-Atlantic Wrestling for years and years and years. Uh, you don't know how great you had it and the great superstars that the Crockett family brought in here from Jim Crockett Sr., to John Ringley, to Jim Crockett Jr., Jackie and David Crockett. They were great people to work for and they always listened to the fans out there and you guys always told them they listened to you and thank you very much for being here tonight. Jack and Jerry Briscoe.